Hello popcorn junkies, welcome to this review of Terrifier 3. Yep, Terrifier 3, I managed to find a screening. It's not on in many places, but this is the other clown that was doing the rounds on our big cinema screens around the same time that that other clown, Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker was out there. And this clown pretty much kicked the other clown out of town. So um, so this is Terrifier 3. Uh, now, I have to sort of say, caveat, 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 I am not an aficionado of the franchise. This is Terrifier 3, which means there's been Terrifier 2, there's been Terrifier before that, and there was also before that All Hallows Eve, I think it was called in 2013, directed by Damien Leone, no relationship to Sergio Leone. Um, so these are, the, I think these have a, these baked into the Terrifier franchise is a cult status. They're, comic schlock, gloopy, body horror, slasher movie type madness writ large, but in which they sort of, they actively indulge in, take advantage of and relish their sort of B-movie, cheap, um, no holds barred, gross out kind of ever more inventive ways of disposing of body parts, chopping people up and, and just being generally fucking disgusting. Basically, this is the Christmas movie you never knew you wanted because it starts and you think, oh my God, this is like a sort of bootleg copy of a VHS of Home Alone from the 1980s. It's that the, the quality and the, the caliber of filming. It's like it's been shot on VHS and then sort of knocked up to 16 mil and then banged up again to 35 mil. This feels like it was a film made in the 1980s that's been refound, not restored, and then played in a sort of sleazy flea pit cinema. That's, that's, that's the feeling you get from this. This film leaves you feeling a bit dirty. You come out of seeing this film feeling like you've got fleas. In terms of filmmaking, as a filmmaker, I was watching this thinking, this is really convincing, a really convincing period piece because it's not set in the 80s because they've all got smartphones, but it looks so 80s. Terrify 3, like all the other films, pivots around Art the Clown. Um, so this was my first, this was my virginal outing. This was my debut experience of the Terrifier franchise and Art the Clown. And it took a little bit of getting on board with how self-consciously camp this film is. I mean, I didn't realise that the, the guy who, play, who plays Terrifier the Clown, is it David Howard Thornton? It's so sort of um, pantomime -y, bad clown performy, smiley, smiley, which at first I couldn't get on board with, but then by the end of this film is truly the mark of horror. This is a really badly story arced film, uh, but because it's so badly story arced, it kind of makes it even better. The problem with this film is it's incredibly postmodern. It's so bad it's good, but it was made to be so bad it's good, which means that if that is your intention, they've done a really successful job. That means it's good at being so bad it's good it's good at being so bad it's good because it knows it's so bad it's going to be good this is slasher 18 certificate horror like no other and really in any review of a film like this it's really hard not to just do a review really and move through sequentially the various moments of bloodletting and chopping and slashing. There are a lot of oh my god moments in this. There are lots of wincing moments and even though you know it's all special effects and they've gone down the butchers and the abattoir and they've got loads of sausages to look like intestines. The fact that there are ever more inventive ways of flaying skin off and chopping hair off. The story of sorts as I understand it there's a woman and her brother, she's been in an insane asylum. They were both haunted and nearly killed by Art the Clown years ago. They've come back out, they're with a family, and Art the Clown's back out and he wants vengeance and all this kind of malarkey. So we start with a domestic setting, as I say, a la Home Alone. It's Christmas. They, I think they could have done it, they could have splashed out a bit more money on better Christmas tunes, actually. You've got, you know, Christmas tree, kids are excited, there's a little girl, she's like, Wee! it's Christmas, she's running around. I, I've heard Father Christmas, there's someone on the roof, someone on the roof. And then basically what we see is her Johnny, or whatever his name is, her brother, uh, gets chopped into 16,000 pieces by Art the Clown, who basically, Art the Clown has broken in, don't think he's come down the chimney, but maybe he has. Maybe he's just literally come down the chimney. Uh, he's gone up, he's chopped them up. He's really, really chopped up the husband. And the husband gets chopped almost up into a sort of bag of mulchy stuff before his wife even wakes up, which says to me that she's a deep sleeper. The reason it's all choppy, choppy, choppy. There's lots of blood. You've got the mad art, the clown grinning with his sort of, you know, ever more sort of sadistic kind of smile. But where I realized, oh, this is my first experience of Terrifier. Oh, 
these films are willing to go where other films don't go was a moment where you thought there was just a moment where you thought mum was going to escape but then the axe goes into the back of her shoulder she's on the floor he then chops her head in half you think he peels her hair off then her face off and then he goes walking around looking for the child the baby girl well not baby the toddler girl the young girl and whilst we don't see the young girl get chopped up, we see him find her in a cupboard and then we cut to the axe and we know what happens. We know what happens. So, so there we go. It's a Christmas film. But here's the thing. So in this film, I don't know what's happened to Art the Clown before. I don't know who Victoria Hayes is and is now possessed by the little pale girl. But put it this way, the woman with one eye and the burnt face who basically becomes Art the Clown's essentially girlfriend. This is like the most gruesome, dysfunctional Bonnie and Clyde twist as Art the Clown and the little pale girl uh, kind of get together. But there's a moment in a, in a prison or an asylum earlier where you see... Art the Clown eating the face of a body and then the head is on the end of a sort of sticky bit of flesh and then there's this the pale little girl has possessed this woman let's call her the pale little girl and then they go into this house where they go into hibernation but there was one particular scene there in the sort of rebirth or the resurrection if you like of Art the Clown and the little pale girl in the form of this weird fucked up woman whilst whilst Art the Clown is killing one of the cops I couldn't believe this scene the, the female humanoid little pale girl starts to masturbate with a broken shard of glass. If ever there was a film where Nadia's line, Nadia being my wife, where she says, how can you watch this? You must be so sick. I've never subscribed to that. I think horror films are always kind of speaking to some latent, hidden underbelly of truth. They kind of, they're exploring the deep psychoanalytical kind of, you know, myriad of difficulties that we encounter and face as humans. It's about us facing our worst fears. It's about our worst fears being given material form. It's about the unknown. It's about the familiar of the unfamiliar, the Heimlich of the unheimlich and all that bollocks. I have to say, if there's one film that perhaps puts all that in the bin and says, you're a sick fucker for watching this and enjoying it, it's Terrifier 3, because really this is just a film of sequences of watching Art the Clown chop people up in more and more potentially inventive ways and smiling and grinning whilst he does it at the same time. The thing is, there are moments of great humour and silliness in this, as well as the horror. So we have Art the Clown dressed as sort of in a sort of Santa's outfit, comes into a bar, comes in where there's a real Santa Claus, but then Art the Clown comes in. And you now know, it's, it's already sort of baked into the idea that whenever Art the Clown turns up, you pretty much know most people are going to end up dead. But he comes in with a sack and he has high jinks and joshes with them, he has a drink. He sits on the real life human's Santa Claus's lap and then pisses all over him. He wets himself, which causes them all to have a fight. And then he kills them all too. But he kills Father Christmas or the Father Christmas impersonator by tying him to a chair. And he's tested this kind of liquid nitrogen freeze gun. It's like a fire extinguisher. So he freezes Santa Claus's arms and legs and feet and then smashes them to bits with a, with a hammer. And so you've got to give it to this, that within the limited creativity afforded in a slasher movie where really it's about blades chopping dicing and all that kind of stuff this film does manage to stay quite inventive as it kind of proceeds to kind of chop more and more people up there are some nice moments like for example the the, the lead character who we follow what's her name sienna who's the woman who survived a previous art the clown incident in another film she has hallucinations she's the one who's been let out from the asylum uh, she has this great scene where she's sitting around having dinner with the family that she's kind of you know embedded with again her her cousin and nephew whatever it's all kind of incidental all that sort of stuff i mean i have to say the script is so awful do american families live like this i mean you know it, even the script is achingly obvious and purposefully bad. I mean, this film, in every single regard, just succeeds at being really bad. And in that sense, you can only say this is really good at being bad, and it really is. The, the dialogue's bad, the acting's bad, the special effects, as in the gore, are pretty good. They're pretty good. They're pretty convincing. They make you look away. I mean, I said last week or a couple of weeks ago, The Substance is perhaps the most squelchiest film I've seen this year. Well, wow. In the same year, this film has kind of transcended that and become much squelchier than the substance this makes the substance look like a trot down the local abattoir They're all the while that every now and then they get on the tube uh art the clown and his partner i like this odd couple and some of the most creepiest moments in this film are when it sort of calms down and just sits with these characters just doing ordinary things like traveling on the tube 
or making a cup of tea. Not that I think they do, but there are a couple of moments where they're just doing normal, ordinary stuff, and that's when it's creepy. At those points, I was really getting sort of almost Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibes, you know, the idea of, ugh, these really contorted, fucked up, monstrous things are trying to lead normal lives and do normal things. And I think the horror in these, this film was most successful when they were going about normal domestic kind of chores. And so we have two more really quite awful kind of set pieces. You don't watch Terrifier 3 and you're, you're not fact checking the script and you're not thinking, does that make sense? None of it fucking makes sense. All you do know is if Art the Clown turns up, you're fucked. Now, one of the dodgiest aspects of this that doesn't really work, and I don't think this will have happened or been picked up really in America, is Art the Clown, certainly when he was dressed as Santa Claus, was, was curiously and pruriently reminiscent of uh, Jimmy Savile, which begged two sort of things. One, it was deeply uncomfortable to watch because he looked like Jimmy Savile, but clearly the filmmakers were unaware of this, American filmmakers, that, that he was anything like that. But two, it just reminded me of, how did we not pick up the fact that Jimmy Savile was such a fucking dark, twisted paedophile? I mean, they look so like each other at times. It's quite, quite shocking. So then we have another scene in which, so as I say, our lead character, Sienna, she's having fantasies. She's seeing, not fantasies, hallucinations. Great scene where she sees her dead friend over the dinner. It reminds reminded me of uh, an American werewolf in London where, you know, uh, the Griffin Dunn character keeps coming back from the dead and sort of haunting him, but is getting sort of more and more sort of de decomposed each time he visits and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was nice. I thought that was a, that was a nice twist because her friend is at the dinner table as a vision and a hallucination. You know, all her skin has been blanched, her eyes hanging out. She looks fucking disgusting. But she's rowing with her. They're arguing at the table. I mean, of course, none of the family see it because it's an hallucination. So th there's some nice touches like that, really sort of inventive kind of fun little moments where the horror isn't just the slashing and the chopping. We then have a sort of quintessential slasher horror sort of in college kind of situation where you've got these this couple of, there's this girl who does a podcast, true crime podcast, she has a boyfriend, they're having sex and so you know the big marker is if they if she grinds on his lap a bit and they have a bit of nookie then you know she's going to be one for the old cookie jar because he's going to chop her up into pieces and anyway we have one of the most shocking scenes in the film like it hasn't been shocking enough already where uh, you know this two young teens, they're, they're having sex in the shower. Oh, fuck, here comes Art the Clown. Now, the girl who runs the True Crime podcast has said, I'd love to look into his eyes, Art the Clown, because she wants to get an interview with Sienna. But anyway, so Art the Clown's outside the shower, and he fucking goes in with a chainsaw, chops her up, pulls his glasses off, looks in her eyes, like... <laughs> chops a leg off, holds it up, looks at it. I mean, that's what it's like... <laughs> throws it off. It's kind of like, it's like kids entertainment does serial killing, basically. I mean, that's what this is. And I have to say, it's quite unique, you know, almost like the artistry of balloon sculpture, but you're using leg parts and body parts. Anyway, so, anyway, so the poor boyfriend of this podcast pet girl, who's been chopped up and sliced in the shower, literally gets a chainsaw up the jacksy, has his penis and bollocks split in two. You see it, you see it. And at this point again, Nadia's on my shoulder going, you've got to be one sick motherfucker to sit through something like this. And I have to say, I felt a bit sick. I felt a bit bad because at one point, you know when you're in the cinema these days, someone who works at the cinema often opens the door at about 45 minutes or an hour and 20, just to have a little look in, I suppose, make sure no one's using their phones to film it and pirate camera it or anything. They come in with a notepad and they do that. Anyway, a woman came in, she did that, and as she came in, the chainsaw was going up his, she, he was ripping him quite literally, chainsawing, chainsawing him. Not a new asshole, but a new cleft to the butt cheeks that ran all the way up his back and through his head. And then we build to this, the denouement, the finale, the sort of the Christmas gathering, if you like, where the dad has been killed and chopped open, sliced open, and then pinned against the wall. Mum's brought in, this is the, the mum of the family that Sienna is now sort of living with, mum's brought in. And I think, wow, well, they're not gonna kill her, but I was then reminded, I thought, hang on, little girl under the, in, in the cupboard underneath the sink, she got chopped up too. They, they, these films are willing to go to places no one else was willing to go to. And what did they do to the mother of this family? They get a great big jar, sort of like glass tube. They jam it into her throat, I kid you not. They then get rats, feed the rats down the tube and using a flamethrower, they, they, they heat their bottom so that they've run into the mouth of the mother. So she's got rats in her neck. The layers and levels of inventiveness mean that I immediately demand that someone needs to get in touch with these filmmakers. Damien Leone is so dark and twisted. He's written it, he's directed it, and he's produced it. He's so frightening in the inventiveness with which he constructs these things that 
I don't think you should be allowed out again. Forcing rats down someone's throat through a tube with a blowtorch. And then they cut here to let them out. I mean, I know I'm, I'm sort of giving you just a list of things that happen. This is a film, this film really is a, just a list or a sequence of ever more hideous ways of killing people. And then a fight breaks out. And then, and then we've got Sienna, who's basically had her hands smashed up. And she then has, the, she's hidden behind the Christmas tree, a sword that is the kind of, it all got a bit Dungeons and Dragons at this point, a bit Excalibur, get the sword. And all the while, the little pale girl, and it's weird. It's like, it's like Art the Clown and the little pale girl woman with the kind of bulbous eye and the sort of bald head and dying face. It's like they're on some kind of weird, perverted, twisted kind of sex kick. I mean, I quite like the fact that they were like a couple doing this together. But the end of the film really does leave us with a sort of, you know, a bit of a cliffhanger where you're left thinking, oh, fucking hell, Art the Clown is still around. And so all in all, what was my terrifier experience like? Was I terrified? I have to confess, I was never at any point actually scared. This film is totally about gross out. When you kind of wince or look away, it's because you're just looking away because you're you're just like it's a bit like in smile too every time you saw her legs snap it's just like ah the sound and the look and the thought you imaginatively place your body into the film and you think oh my god if that was to happen to me that would just be awful so it's wincy it's tasteless it's not terrifying it's not actually and i hate to say it for any terrifier fans out there it's not that funny it thinks it's funnier than it is. And I, I think it's purposefully trying to be eggy in its funniness, but it ends up just being a bit eggy. So I wasn't actually that impressed with the whole gurning stupidity of the clown bit, you know, art oh, doing all of this. But I do think it's an incredibly brilliant breath of fresh air. And possibly what I'm gonna say is, okay, let's watch a Christmas movie this year, team. And they're gonna say, what's it called? I'm gonna say, it's called, I don't know, it's called Christmas Times Past. It's a new comedy. And then I'm going to put this on and see how they take it. Just avoid the title. I want to play this as a as a covert Christmas movie and see how they all react. What would I score it? Oh, it's hard. It's totally cult fun. It's totally meant to be laughed at. You're not supposed to take it seriously. Um, it's meant to be overacted. It's meant to be badly delivered. The script is meant to be cliche ridden. So if those were all of its intentions, it's successful. I absolutely closed my eyes, winced, looked away and was just horrified and, and amazed, full of almost strange admiration for the ever more inventive way of, of dispatching of people and body parts and bits and bobs. So, you know, the fact that just, just for the fact alone that you see a man's bottom uh, cleft, uh, basically exaggerated, and extended along his spinal column. You don't often get that at the cinema. So it's not for the faint-hearted. It might not be for you. But in its own terms, I think it's kind of successful. And it's trumped. It cost two million to make. And it's made 50 million at the box office. That is a massive return on investment. Um, if I was to score it, <laughs> just in its own terms, I'd give it 68 out of 100.